Well, we've been under-investing both on the public and the private side in agriculture for many decades. And it has been reflected in the world supply and demand. So globally, world supply has been increasing at approximately 1%. And global demand has been rising at 2%. And as a result, uh, after the year 2000, our global food stocks have been diminishing. Uh, once you underinvest in any sector, you begin to just get complacent. You believe that the low food prices will continue. But what it was was a signal to the markets not to reinvest, so that on both the private side as well as on the public side, we just were not investing strongly enough in agriculture. Yes, it's a good thing. Uh, we like to see increasing consumer demand and increasing disposable income so that people begin to buy more food. It happens around the world as prosperity increases. So what we need to focus on as a world is how to increase production, the supply of food, and that will bring down the prices of food so there will be enough food available for all. Yes, all the international institutions, we used to invest heavily in agriculture, and that was very important to the first green revolution, and it changed the landscape of agriculture and of food availability. We became complacent because food prices were low around the world, and it was available and affordable. But now we've had a very strong wake-up call, rising prices in many of the food staples, and a lack of availability and accessibility for many of the uh, most vulnerable and for the poor and particularly in Africa. It's production and it's also its distribution around the world and so we've been focusing in three areas. One is emergency humanitarian assistance. The second is increasing the productivity for farmers and getting more services out to farmers so that they can be more productive. And the third is ways that we can help with trade and with markets. If food can move across borders without delays, without tariffs and without um, restrictions, then food can move to the places it's needed most. If it is blocked, uh, if there are bottlenecks, then food might be across a border but unavailable to people who need it most that are on the other side of the border. Well, we hope so. We are still hopeful on Doha. Uh, trade is a very important part of how food and any commodity moves around the world. So it will be a, a, a key point in trying to solve some of the allocations of food. We're hoping that there will be some progress in it, and we're certainly working hard on it. Well, for the poor around the world, a greater part of their incomes are spent on food. And in a continent like Africa, approximately 70% of the people make their food from farming. And if a African farm is an average of two hectares or less, it means that there has to be high productivity in the farm to both grow food that is nutritious for the family, but also that there is extra leftover to take to the markets. For many of the African countries, the roads are rutted, the markets are a long distance away, the cost of fuel is high. So just getting your pro produce to a market is difficult. And so we've been focusing on a number of areas. Uh, good seeds, seeds that are drought resistant, uh, uh, fertilizer, how land is utilized, good extension services to train farmers in how to grow productive, healthy crops ways to get products to market, encouraging market groups so that they're good pricing, uh, storage facilities, cold storage uh, at a market so that produce can be kept uh, so that it is in good shape when a consumer begins to buy, ports and roads and irrigation systems and tractors and equipment, all of this become very important. So you can also see that it links back to financing for farmers, that there be a availability of microcredit and credit for small and medium-sized enterprises so that they can 
flourish. And in many of the developing countries around the world, credit is hard to come by, as is the infrastructure and many of these inputs into agriculture. The United States is approximately half of the world food aid, and in 2007, we were approximately 60% of food aid. So we take it very seriously, the responsibility to have enough food that is available for the most vulnerable, for those who really are chronically um, in need of food. The areas that we focus on are the Horn of Africa, areas that have had drought, that have had uh, severe dislocations of population and the need for uh, more help. We also are looking at much stronger development programs, so ways that we can reach out to farmers and with agricultural extension. We're investing in research. Uh, we're investing in institutions and agricultural institutions throughout the world, but particularly in Africa, because there are many uh, African solutions that uh, can help the African farmer, and if we can get Africa food self-sufficient, that will help a great deal to solving the world focus. President Bush announced a two-year, $5 billion initiative, and it has all of these parts within it, including trade. And I think that it's a good beginning, but we want the private sector and the private entities to come in and join us. American agro um, processors and agro industry is a very, very important part of this element. They are perhaps 80% of the solution to the problem worldwide. This is a very strong area for us. It's also that our state universities with good research institutions will be very important players. So we have short-term, medium-term, and long-term solutions. We try to meet the needs of those that are most vulnerable first, and the poor are the hardest hit, and part of our mission is to reduce poverty around the world, and so food is a very critical element for that. And then we know that another part of the solution is to help farmers, local farmers, produce and grow more food because that will then also bring incomes into them. It will bring more food onto the markets and it will allow development to occur. So they come together. It's an integrated approach and it's very important for development to look in short-term, medium-term and long-term approaches. And the United States has been very generous that way, and there is a strong commitment to be early and important in our efforts to solve this crisis. Well, we're focusing first on West Africa, and there are particular five countries because this can be a breadbasket for Western Africa. It means that there can be an increase in food staples. Our goal is to double production in food staples in West Africa and we've been reaching out to a number of the universities, to the number of the farmer groups. We've been encouraging markets to set good prices because if you can get a good price for your crop it means that as a farmer you have an incentive to plant a crop and to sell a crop in the markets because you know that you can get a return on your investment. We've also been working with a number of credit institutions to get credit out to farmers, and not just for one harvest, but something that would take them through a second harvest and a third harvest, in case uh, they've had a poor harvest in one year, so that they can continue. We've also been working with a number of the uh, research institutions around the world to get more nutritious foods out. So cassava is one, and we've been working on drought-resistant corn and uh, wheat. We've been looking at uh, ways to reduce wheat stem rust, and all of these are part of a global solution. We've also been looking at the area of biotechnology and ways that that can encourage production. In the first Green Revolution, yeah, that was a major contributor to the solutions, and so we would like to see it utilized again in a very strong way around the world. Many of the countries in Africa and in South Asia and around the world are utilizing some part of a biotechnology crop and have had good success with that. So we are seeing that this is a time when many countries are reevaluating their stance and are picking up the fruits of science.
In the spring of 2008, we gathered uh, many of the international institutions uh, during the World Bank IMF spring meetings. And we began to talk about what the scientific research was showing, what the effect was on the poor around the world, where were the hardest hit areas, and what might be some of the keys to increasing production and solving this challenge. And it had a it began many conversations, conversations that have been going on now around the world in a number of fora. We were recently in Rome at the Food and Agriculture Organization's summit in which we talked to a number of the uh, countries and many of them said, please focus on post-harvest because we are losing between 40 to 70 percent of our crops on the way to the market. Others said, let's focus on irrigation, because without irrigation, we do not have water management. We cannot keep our crops in times of drought or lowered rainfall. So we've been gathering all of these thoughts and comments, and as a world, working on ways that we might approach the food challenge. The UN recently had a very good study in which we are looking at the many pieces of the value chain for agriculture and increasing production and we have been strongly working with them and with other nations, uh, particularly in Europe and in Asia, for trying to bring some of these solutions particularly to the developing world and to the developing countries because that's where the people are with the greatest need. Lots of countries uh, give food aid um, in Europe, and many countries are also food exporters so that they're on the open market. Since you know that markets and private sector are very much part of this, the large grain exporters you know, um, whether it is uh, Australia or Ukraine, other countries, Canada, are very important with their food assistance. Uh, but it is both with private assistance as well as with public assistance to try to help send more food into the world food supplies. I think everyone now has woken up that this is now a challenge for all of us. The landscape of food has changed. And as a result, we all need to heed this call and to begin to put in action both public and private solutions. So we're all hard at work on it, and we're trying to work together and work with the developing countries so that we can increase their production and productivity and help uh, out the small farmers around the world. Well, Egypt, like many other countries, has a uh, very uh, strong agriculture sector, but it is not keeping up with the rising prices. Uh, the United States over the years, over the decades, has helped in the agricultural area with Egypt with extension services and uh, with many of the seeds and uh, good agricultural techniques. So we've been good partners working together. I believe uh, now Egypt has become a good partner in South-South cooperation with other countries, and that is a very good new development. So I think all the countries around the world are trying to help each other in solving both the affordability and the availability of food.